Uh, again, my name is Sam Poindexter, NI4TG. Welcome everyone to the August meeting. Uh, if you would mute your mic until you get ready to speak and that way background noise uh, will be eliminated. I've got a couple of announcements uh, tonight. Uh, the December meeting, uh, we assume, will be on Zoom. However, we will not have a presenter for that meeting. We will have a format uh, very similar to what we always do. We just won't be together with the food, but we'll do a format similar to uh, what we always do in December. Uh, another item, uh, please remember that January is show and tell. So be working on your projects, uh, get your notes together, your whatever you need to do and be prepared. Uh, Zoom will be an excellent uh, uh, format to uh, do show and tell. So uh, uh, please remember to get ready for that. I did want to mention too that uh, this is the time of year for the uh, selection, <clears throat> excuse me, of officers uh, for next year. And at the last board meeting, a committee was formed, Ken Kaiser, Harold Richardson, Don Edwards, Stacy MacArthur, and uh, John Knupp were selected to form, uh, to be on the selection committee. And John was promptly promoted to chairperson. So uh, the committee's been working and uh, I understand they're close to a uh, final uh, decision. So at our next meeting, uh, we'll be uh, talking about officers and uh, having that vote. Uh, first thing tonight, uh, Terry, uh, do you want to uh, present us the uh, scoop on the new bylaws? Uh, yes, I'll be very happy to do so. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, first, just a little history. The bylaws were updated and approved many months ago, but uh, some changes we felt were needed, some updates were needed, so we did those. Uh, then that brought in a, another legal review by the attorney and understand that he did the additional review at no charge, thank you. And um, he made some changes too to the bylaws. And of course they've been posted on the website and I did make a summary of the changes that were in the bylaws on the website. Um, and there were some critical sections uh, on indemnification of officers. That was one of attorney addition. And then on no liabilities uh, for club members. Uh, and just some restating of some of the duties of the officers. And also on making sure that certain club records were easily available to key officers or key people within the club. And Sam, that's, that's uh, I think, a pretty good uh, summary right there, so. Okay, well, <clears throat> we need to uh, vote on those bylaws tonight, is that right? Yeah, but does anyone have any questions or comments? Okay, Sam, back over to you. Uh, do we have a motion to accept the uh, bylaws? I make a motion. Okay, thank you, Doc. Here a second. I second, Harlan does. Okay, um, we'll go ahead and vote. I think this is good. The, I know it, the, <clears throat> we've had uh, a little bit of trouble nailing down these bylaws, but the, the most recent additions I think were needed. Uh, so uh, if everyone in favor of accepting these bylaws will raise their hand and keep it up for a minute so I can see everyone okay looks like we're good is there anybody opposed to accepting the bylaws okay so we uh we've accepted the bylaws the lawyers paid and we put that to bed <clears throat> um that's good okay uh henry's with us tonight and henry wanted to give us uh just a quick update on field day. So Henry, microphone to you. 
Thank you, Sam, and uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Henry at W2DZO, and I uh, just wanted to give you a quick update on some data uh, for field day. Some of this was discussed a little bit at the last meeting, but um, um, we've managed to, um, thanks to Harold and Stacy, we've managed to uh, pull this information together. Um, just a reminder, we had 27 uh, total uh, active hams from the club. Um, and of those 27, 23 uh, submitted logs to the league. Um, and, uh, and of the 23 people, 17 uh, sent the summary emails uh, to us from the ARRL. So our score might be r represented, might be a little bit low because there's other points out there. Um, but roughly um, the total points that we've managed to cobble together from the summary sheets is about 17,000 points, a little over 17,500 points for the club, um, which I thought was pretty neat. Um, the logging server that Harold's had set up uh, shows that as a group we had over uh, over 5,000 contacts that came in at right about uh, 5,405 contacts, which is really, really amazing. Um, so I just wanted to, all three of us just wanted to thank everybody again for uh, pulling together in a situation where um, I think we acted as really, really classic ham radio operators and we, uh, we, we went with what the hand, uh, played with the hand we were dealt and we did a great job and we were able to not only um, create some technical boosts and uh, do something new but I think a lot of the folks that actually got involved with it um, had a good time and I think I think what we'll find is what we did this time somehow will be incorporated into next year's and in the future I think the idea of having that server going was just a great idea um, so anyway don't want to take up a lot of time, but thank you again to everybody. Uh, and we'll, um, uh, of course, look for the December, I think it's the December QST when that will all come out. That's it, Sam, back to you, thanks. Okay, thank you, uh, Henry. Uh, we appreciate that and we appreciate your efforts. We, uh, sounds like we had great success. Okay, uh, Kent, if you will give us a treasurer's update Okay, thanks, Sam. Be happy to. Um, as of this afternoon, our current balance is $2,844.85, with no major expenses left to pay for the rest of the year. But actually, it's kind of strange, but Carolly wise, that um, right now we have about uh, twice as much money in the bank as what we had anticipated having this time of year. So, uh, so we're, uh, we're in good, uh, good, good shape that, uh, the web hosting has been paid for, uh, for a year. Thanks to Jim Register. Uh, and as Terry said a little while ago that the, um, the bill for the attorney came in less than what we were expecting. So, uh, so things are looking bright. I appreciate everybody uh, going ahead and getting their dues, uh, in the first part of the year, because that helped quite a bit. Uh, thank you, Kent. We appreciate that. Harlan, uh, you're up next uh, to give us an Oxcom Aries update. Okay. Uh, thanks, Sam. You can hear me? Yes. Okay. A um, couple of things, uh, just real quick. Uh, when Isaiah was coming up the coast, if uh, everybody remembers the little tropical storm there, uh, that was uh, became a hurricane before it uh, actually came inland, had that... Uh, hurricane moved a little bit further north and uh, which would have put it just inland a little bit. One, it would have put Wilmington in the crosshairs um, pretty much, but it would have affected us as well. The state of North Carolina emergency management for the first time uh, did a statewide OXCOM activation they sent out an email to everybody that's registered within the OXCOM database. And that's the folks that have completed all the trainings that need to be completed and have been listed in the database as completed and uh, part of the OXCOM system. They sent everybody an, e an email. They also sent all the OXCOM managers an email asking us to have our units stand by as well. 
And I'm not going to go into detail as to what the plans were, but it was going to be a unique activation should things have required at supplemental communications. So it is important we maintain our training, we maintain our expertise. We just did a uh, Zoom uh, meeting with WebEOC for those that were currently qualified in it and those that wanted the training. We did a uh, two hour session the other night and had nine folks. I would have liked to have had more. I do encourage all of our OXCOM folks to get the WebEOC training. I can do the class again uh, here in the future and I'd like to do another one before we have the exercise on the 12th of September. Uh, again, mark your calendars for the 12th of September, one o'clock in the afternoon to four o'clock. We are going to have a real-time communications exercise. There's going to be a lot of traffic passed. It, some will be tactical traffic, some will be logistical, some will be uh, formal, meaning an ICS 213. Certain people will have to log stuff into Web EOC, and others will have to pull that information out of Web EOC, generate a message as if they were at that particular site, and then get it passed over the air. We will be using multiple frequencies, multiple ways of doing this stuff. So it's gonna probably be the most complex exercise we've ever tried to do as a uh, OXCOM group here in the county. And we are involving county personnel with that exercise. So with that being said, again, mark your calendars. Please make sure you got the training. And uh, we're looking at putting the MCOM course and the EOC course uh, both of those are day courses normally. We're trying to put that into a web system uh, where we can do that. And right now the thought is to split that up into both of those into four two-hour blocks that we would do over a month period. And then anybody that needs it can get it get it done. Would you repeat the date, please? 12, Oct or 12 September. That was the date that Tour de Tanglewood was supposed to occur but because Tanglewood has been canceled, we're gonna do the exercise. Sam, that's it unless somebody's got a question. What was the time, Harlan? 1300 to 1600, three hours. We're gonna pack about eight hours worth of stuff into three hours. Thank right. you, Harlan. Thanks, Sam. Uh, that sounds good. Uh, next, we'll get a repeater report from Dale. I see Dale's joined us. Dale, you want to give us a repeater report? Sure, Sam. Thank you. And good evening, everybody. Hope you're doing well. Uh, the repeaters are, are doing okay. Um, 4 7 uh, is being used occasionally for the uh, Vagabond Net. We'll switch over the Equilink uh, node uh, when we can, but uh, it seems to be okay. There's been some uh, preliminary reports and some static at times. I think those are mostly on the 147.315 repeater, but it might be also on the 47. We haven't been able to delineate that from the report. So we're watching it, but it seems to be used quite regularly and uh, hear folks on every morning and haven't heard any interference issues. But if there are, please email me at my call at triad.rr.com. Uh, the 6-4 machine, we used that the other day, it seems to be up, but the, the range is still limited as our, our access to the hospital is limited. So we'll just kind of stay on standby until we can uh, go ahead and uh, get there. The 4-7 the node, which is directed to 315, the Echolink node, that seems to be up and operating okay, and we've been watching that as well. Um, let's see, if, should I go on to testing, Sam? Yes, please. Okay. Testing, we've, uh, we're, as everybody knows, I believe we're under the W4 VEC management, which is different <coughs> from the ARRL management. Got a bulletin the other day that said uh, basically um, the W4 VEC 
sessions will most likely be canceled to the end of not September, but October, Halloween, and that the majority of session managers are just simply canceling it to the end of the year. We're not um, ruling out the possibility of outdoor sessions, but uh, uh, don't, don't have uh, any definite plans for that now. We're advising folks as they email us or call on the telephone to please watch the uh, updates that are provided on the W4NC website. And Terry does an excellent job of that. Thanks, Terry, if you're there. And uh, we'll get updates to him as we can. Uh, the other thing that we're very um, strong in our statement is that there will be, under W4VEC, no remote testing. Sorry, folks. No remote testing is authorized under the W4VEC management. So that's about it, Sam. Unless there's any questions, I'll pause a minute. Okay, having heard none, thanks again, everybody, and appreciate it, Sam. Back to you. Uh, thank you, Dale. Oh, one other uh, thing, Sam. Yes. One other. I forgot to mention on uh, rather notable on the uh, Sourtown Mountain Internet site, um, the uh, provider up there has been working hard. He's changing. He went ahead and changed out the um, core routers Sunday, and he's still working on it today. And um, we had sent a payment, annual payment for next year, and talks are open to uh, negotiate uh, uh, the, the billing, change our billing date, perhaps again, for services that are lost. We want to make sure, he wants to make sure everything is up and running. So that's very <coughs> fair and applaudable of him. As we get more information, we'll let you know. So since they're only the only provide, internet provider on the mountain, we basically um, have no other choice to go to. So I, I think they're making a good faith effort. And as I say, as updates come through, we'll let you know. Thank you, Sam. OK, Dale, thank you. We appreciate that. <clears throat> OK, well, that takes care of most of our business. Uh, I'm going to let. Uh, Dick Hathaway introduce our guest speaker tonight. Dick, microphone over to you. Oh, thank you very much. I had to hustle to get it turned on. I hope it. I hope it's there. Uh, Caesar is uh, has been to so many places with the IOTA uh, endeavors that he's he's done over the years. And uh, I'm just excited that we've talked about doing this program for off and on for two years. And uh, I'm excited that we're getting to do it tonight. So Caesar, you're there. Uh, you can do a, I guess, yeah, you can hear, I guess you can hear me. We can, uh, we can turn it over to you and let you get started. I'm buzzing through here. There he is. Uh, you have to turn your mic on, Caesar. There's a bottom left-hand corner. Click on it and get your mic on. There you go. Okay. Um, I'll have to do, I guess, a share screen so that we can um, have a little bit of a presentation here. Uh, but I'd like, to, first of all, to thank you very much for uh, having me tonight. As I quickly um, just browse through the call signs of the participants, uh, your members, I realize that um, we have a few passionate uh, IOTA members. Um, IOTA obviously stands for Islands on the Air. I'm sure that all of you are familiar with that, or at least you know, uh, know that. So uh, Wayne uh, W4HG, it's um, on, the, on the honor roll on the uh, uh, upper part of, uh, of the IOTA roster. Uh, then uh, Tony uh, W4FOA, uh, he's an avid uh, island chaser, but uh, I don't think he's a member of um, <clears throat> our group yet. Uh, we, I, I assume he wants to achieve some uh, high uh, performance before he joins for one reason or another. And uh, Dick is definitely uh, a prospect, uh, the way we call it. Uh, he's uh, working towards, um, I assume, his first submission before not too long. So um, what I'd like to do, first of all, uh, is to go through a few minutes, which are not going to be probably very um, 
um, are going to be somewhat, uh, how should I say, um, uh, unsalty. Uh, but I'd like to, for all of us to have a little bit of a common understanding of what this Islands on the Air is all about. And then I'm going to, so hopefully this will last, I don't know, I have in mind, um, let's say less than 10 minutes. Uh, maybe six, seven minutes, and then um, um, do a few, uh, go, go through uh, some slides which are part of some, well, which were taken during some of the recent trips uh, that I have been a part of. So um, let me see if I can uh, do this. Uh, screen. Okay. I assume that you do see this, right? Yes. Okay, uh, let's go to from the beginning. Um, so you should be having on your monitor right now this uh, PowerPoint presentation. Uh, am I right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. So um, I didn't know how to uh, call it. So since I've never met uh, you before in this format, I said, let's talk about IOTA. <laughs> Um, and uh, what IOTA is all about, as you see in our logo, it's silence on the air. Uh, and um, um, the, the, this was an initiative started by a, a, a British, um, uh, you know, a sh shortwave listener named Geoff Watts, who is no longer with us. And he took care of it um, in a very, very uh, old fashioned way with um, pieces of paper and pens and uh, tried to, 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 to create um, a way in which the geography was, uh, uh, was paramount as opposed to uh, the political environment, which is uh, what the XCC is all about. And, um, uh, you know, in 1985, he turned the program to the RSGB um, and Roger Ballister, uh, who was with the program from the very beginning, became the manager. And for a long number of years, he had a constant preoccupation to build the program and develop it on, uh, in, a, in a very structured way, um, going, you know, keeping the, uh, the original um, aim of uh, Joff, but uh, going much, much further from there. And um, then uh, over the next, I'd say about 15 years, 2000, 2015, you'll see why I'm, I'm stopping in 2015. I, I put that boundary there. Um, I think that the program um, received a lot of recognition and the, uh, the, 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 it widened the, the, you know, the participation, more countries, more continents and so on and so forth. So um, in 2016, um, for a number of reasons, which I'm not going to get in detail right now, um, the RSGB and a group of enthusiasts, including Roger and myself, uh, decided that the best way to move forward is by IOTA to have its own administration. And so uh, a nonprofit uh, organization was created in 2016 called IOTA Limited, or Islands on the Air Limited. And the UK, uh, it's a, it's a UK um, non-for-profit organization. And I think that since uh, we incurred uh, significant growth and the program incurred significant growth um, by introduction, particularly by introduction of credits through the QSO matching, something similar to what the uh, LOPW has done for the DXCC. Um, you see here uh, how the membership uh, in the annual listing, sorry, how the participation in the annual listing. So there are about half of the members uh, uh, appear in the annual listing because you have to renew, you have to apply, you have to, to keep your, um, your, um, your scores updated uh, within a certain time or otherwise you'll drop off the annual listing, then you obviously can get back in. But you could see that in 90, so about 30 years ago, um, there was uh, about, you know, three quarters of the program membership of the uh, annual listing membership was um, from Europe and North America had about a, a quarter. Um, and you can see the difference today, Asia in particular, you can actually see that Oceania, uh, well, it's a six time increase. It's not that many, but it's a major um, for, for, for the size of the continent and the, the members, the, uh, the, the ham radio population. It's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting in increase. And on the bottom uh, chart, you see, um, um, you know, for different, uh, different um, um, 
different, um, I'm trying to move away from here if I could, let's see if I can, yeah. Uh, we, you can see the, uh, the, oops, the percentage of members from, um, uh, from different uh, DXCCs. And um, the percentage is a little bit, um, uh, you know, it, it's something that, you know, just allows me to, to claim that it's a wider continental representation, it's a general wider representation, but the percentage obviously doesn't say much about the absolute numbers. So what I can tell you, you know, this is just a comparison between the guys who are coming um, very strong from about one and a half percent to now about 6% and that's the UA zero. Then you have Japan who increased over the last 20 years, it's their membership in the annual listing from about seven, eight percent to uh, double. And um, it, it's all in support of this idea that uh, it is a, it's a growing um, interest and that um, we uh, are convinced to continue like that. Now, the core principles of the program is that it offers a blend between natural boundaries of world geography, islands, and the political order. The DXCC, the entities, do play a role in the way we, we, um, we group these islands. And there's a structure based on very specific rules available on, you know, in the IOTA directory on the IOTA website with a cap of 1,200 island groups. And um, obviously the other things are probably relatively trivial, but I just thought of pointing them out. Uh, there's, uh, a, yeah. there's obviously a definition of an island, what does represent an island, and uh, the program only deals with uh, open sea islands, so we're talking about the world oceans, not lakes, rivers, or um, things like that. And um, there are a number of uh, groups, as I said, uh, up to those 1,200, uh, which are based on a number of principles and the changes of uh, some dimensions, um, some, some um, the minimum uh, length or uh, criteria will automatically have worldwide implications. So we will move probably from 1200 to maybe 1300 or 1400 or 1500 just by changing one of those um, elements. Now, to give you an idea, though, <clears throat> for those who are not familiar, uh, who might have heard of IOTA, but are not familiar with the program, the DXCC currently, which I'm sure that all of you are familiar with, currently has 340 entities. We, we, the IOTA has uh, 11 and 35 credited entities to date. Uh, and the top score um, has 1131 confirmed. So um, uh, there are 63 stations with more than 1100, uh, so on and so forth. And there are separate listings and separate uh, rankings for pretty much, you know, clubs and shortwave listeners and VHF and uh, HF and so on and so forth. Now, to just give you an idea from my peer personal experience, it took me 15 years to confirm 1,000 credits, I, I, you know, and it took about um, 24 and a half to confirm 1,100. Now, keep in mind that some of the people who started this program, who were uh, who joined the program day one, uh, when when Geoff Watts created it back in you know 55 plus years ago, almost 60 years ago, um, it took them longer because the program developed and based on the new structure, um, we have been able to create uh, additional groups and um, it, you know it, it, it was a certain evolution. Now, the credit system, um, it's still based on QSL cards. Uh, there will be um, um, a, number of, uh, <laughs> a number of amateurs, a number of uh, activators who simply would not uh, issue anything but QSL cards. Uh, but we are now offering also QSL matching via Clublog um, and also via um, LOTW. And uh, they're also uh, for the IOTA contests, the logs which are sent directly to the RSGB contest committee. IOTA contest is not taken care of, by, is not administered by, by our group, but by the RSGB. Uh, we have access, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, um, uh, there's a proprietary system, but it's a safe system. 
uh, on which uh, uh, credits can be uh, provided by, uh, by QSO matching. And, um, and um, just to give an idea, there are currently over 10,000 operations from more than 1,000 groups, uh, which are available for QSO matching. And we have actually issued uh, two um, plaques of excellence, which are obtained for having making credits, uh, having obtained credits for with the 750 groups. Um, and there, there are several other words for 600 and 500 and 400 IOTAs obtained all through QSO matching. Um, we believe that by the end of this year, we'll have about 75% of all credits issued annually um, through QSO matching and because the community wants this, uh, obviously some people not, but most of them do, um, we will continue to, um, to develop uh, new steps uh, towards automation and uh, including automation and uh, manual processing to, um, to increase this as much as we can. So it's a, I think it's a vibrant program, um, which has uh, noticed an increase by 16% compared to, uh, to just four or five years ago, um, after being stagnant for almost a decade in the number of stations listed in the annual ranking. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it, it tells a little bit, I think, about the fact that uh, there are people excited about uh, contacting this uh, strange islands sometimes and uh, very rare, very, uh, very, very rarely operated and so on and so forth. Uh, are there any questions so far, please? If not, I'll move into uh, my IOTA expeditions and we'll see, um, just to introduce myself a little bit, there are lots of expeditioners and there are people who have made huge contributions over the years to this program. Um, I joined the group <laughs> a little, um, uh, you know, kind of um, uh, towards the end of the 2000s. And um, uh, my particular interest is in uh, activating, uh, operating from very rare island groups, those which are highly needed by IOTA members. And um, I have had the opportunity to travel to and operate from 18 of those in top 30. Now, I mentioned there that this is equivalent to top 10 DXCCs because if you compare the number of entities to the number of IOTA groups, as I mentioned earlier, 340 against 1135 to date, um, you will realize that there will be more than probably about 3.3 times uh, more uh, DXCC. So being in the top 33 will automatically be an, an, an autom a, 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 a top DX 10 DXCC equivalent. So um, for you know operations from um, credits from Bouvet, for example, or Peter the First are are probably not that rare for IOTA participants there will be 60% or more, maybe 65% of all the IOTA members who would have had those credits. But some of these islands, which are very remote uh, and uh, difficultly accessible uh, with a lot of restrictions from governments and all sorts of other issues um, are not easily accessible. Also, there's a, there's a, um, uh, you know, there's a financial component to it and, uh, you know, we're not going to mention too much about it, but um, uh, we have about 4,000 members. Uh, DXCC probably has at least 10 times more. So you could see the, the, the difference in, in the potential funding and interest that um, we could benefit from. So, as I mentioned, I enjoy the destinations, but I'm thrilled by the journeys. Um, this idea of putting in, you know, teams together and going through hell and back in order to get somewhere and make sure that you come back safe. Um, it's, it's something that thrills me very much. And my motto, if you want, is dream big and dare to fail, which is part of one. I mean, I mentioned that in one of my uh, publications. So, um, I was blessed that QSD editors decided over the years to grace uh, the operations that I have been part of with five um, covers of, of their magazines, which um, I don't know if it's a record, but it's definitely a record for IOTA um, activators. 
So let's go quickly. Uh, I have uh, lots of slides. Um, there'll be, um, I'm, I'm just gonna make very brief presentation about um, the scope and then the rest will be um, very easy to, uh, to figure out. Um, <clears throat> so in, in December of, uh, of, of, of uh, 2018, uh, I, I set my eyes on a group, uh, on, on two IOTA groups, um, at, which are the southeastern end of, uh, of French Polynesia. Um, so Gambia, Mangareva is the place where uh, the boat leaves to Pitcairn every several weeks now. It used to be much rarer than that, three months. Um, and uh, as you can see, uh, the islands, this, uh, this island, this group Action has not been, uh, has only been on the air once, 28.5 years earlier. And Morani was a new, uh, as a new group. Just imagine a new DXCC to, if I can make the comparison. The hell would break loose on the, on the, on the, um, when, when you, when you, when you, when you launch the first CQ. Um, so the islands are approximate, are obviously in a triangle, uh, and uh, the distance between them, it's not that large. However, the difficulty is that both uh, our targets, Maria S. and Morane, are, um, uh, are fu have fully enclosed uh, lagoons. That means that there's no entrance into the lagoon and you have to land hard and make sure that you survive the landing with all your equipment and then uh, somehow figure out a way to get off the reef. Um, obviously you need some good, you know, good weather, good time, and, and uh, you know, in order to attend something like this. So the operators were uh, Adrian, my very good friend from uh, New York and myself, and um, we traveled to, together from San Francisco uh, landing in Papiete, spend uh, a day or two there, and then um, uh, somehow we we made our way to um, uh, we made our way to uh, Mangareva. Uh, in Mangareva, um, uh, you see a little bit, you know, how the boat uh, looked like that we uh, we hired, and uh, um, you know, it was a fifty foot um, a fifty foot. Um, boat with a very, very exper experienced um, um, group of guys. Uh, there was uh, a husband and wife uh, who previously I've met in, um, uh, you know, in, in, in uh, very close to Cape Horn uh, on a different trip. Um, <clears throat> so the difficulty, as I mentioned, is that you come in and then we landed uh, and, and then because the wind changed a few days later when we had to leave, we had to cross the lagoon, go across the lagoon with all the equipment, and then um, from there be picked up. Uh, the situation in Maria Est Morani was the first one we did. Maria Est, the situation was a little more complicated because um, the, um, um, the, um, the, the geography and everything was such that we actually had to carry the inflatable, the dinghy, uh, over probably altogether more than about a kilometer and a half um, and the heat and everything else and the fact that we were already kind of exhausted, uh, not a very good, uh, we, we might be good operators but, uh, or somewhat good operators, but we're not definitely in very great shape, uh, took a toll on us. Um, so um, here's the first uh, island. Do you see the type of uh, landing that you do? Um, you have to pace against the waves in order to go over the hump, go over the reef. Uh, the reef, uh, obviously we wear boots and uh, pretty heavy equipment, uh, mountaineering-like, so that um, we don't get hurt. And, um, you know, we brought everything we needed, uh, generators, we had batteries just in case the generators would, <laughs> would leave us uh, um, right away, um, and uh, in relatively short time, everything was installed. We had two uh, multi um, uh, <clears throat> multi band um, verticals, and uh, we were on the air. Uh, it's a nice uh, baby, not super baby, not not tiny, tiny little baby, but it's a young uh, frigate, 
and um, uh, you know the mass boobies. Lots of other guys have seen. Many of you have seen this uh, either by yourselves in in some of the um, islands in you know in Oceania or uh, in, in different QSL cards. And um, one of the many hermit crabs, which were uh, everywhere, the, the lagoons was full of tiny little sharks. So these guys are not that big. They're about, um, about three feet long. Uh, however, they, they tend to nip. Um, so, the, you know, so it's, um, it, it was, uh, we had to be, uh, we, we're not used to that. And when two, three would come very close uh, to us, uh, we wouldn't be uh, feeling very, great, very good. Um, uh, so anyway, this was uh, Bernard, our uh, Robinson. <laughs> so um, um, we, um, he, he was, um, he has the pileup, uh, my friend Adrian operating, uh, not sure what, maybe 30, 40 meters. Um, um, looks like this was in the daytime, but uh, it could be falling, could be right. Um, um, right at the uh, j just before the dark or before I I I, I don't remember that. Um, <clears throat> so um, um, the um, uh, we uh, you know four or five years into this about four years into this we, uh, we we pack and go. We had as I said since the wind you can see where our initial tent was and we had to go all across the lagoon. It's, you know, you have the impression that's nothing here. Well, it's very, very, um, um, you know, uh, uh, it's tricky. You have to be very careful. Uh, the, the corral would, would cut absolutely like a blade into pretty much anything. So um, uh, finally we get back on the boat and here are landed on Maria about, you know, about 24 hours later. Um, installed everything very quickly and um, you know the generators um, this is the um, our little uh, uh, camp the station with the tracking device um, and our communication and the meal uh, meals served and co cooked and served absolutely incredible meals by our guide Bernard who decided to stay with us on the second island for the entire duration because he anticipated that we will have to cross the lagoon and his help uh, would have been, uh, you know, keeping the boat and having him there would have been so much easier. Um, he was an exquisite uh, fisher, but fisherman, but uh, an absolute uh, incredible cook. And uh, on the island, uh, there are some remnants of a previous uh, coconut oil plantation and exploitation, which has not been in operation for decades. Um, but there's a still a little church that's that's standing, um, and. Um, uh, you know, during the daytime, we try to breathe a little bit, um, and 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 uh, it was so hot, propagation was absolutely zilch, and the only thing we we tried to sleep it was impossible to sleep it was too hot, but uh, we still uh, tried to get as much shade as we could. Um, we happy, we survived <laughs> the the drill, and. Um, uh, we're carrying the boat uh, with um, uh, Bernard, of course, and uh, uh, Janive, uh, the skipper, who came and, uh, um, you know, during his um, boating of the equipment and provision and all the supplies back to the boat, at some point he uh, his engine wouldn't start and he was pedaling. Um, you know, it, it's part of the adventure. Sure, if, um, if, if you have all the equipment, if you go with Braveheart, and uh, there might be something very different, but um, we can't afford for this operation to spend that kind of uh, budget, to allocate that kind of budget. So uh, it's not on a shoestring, something like this cost on the order of altogether, probably about $24,000 to give you an idea. Um, but, um, it's definitely different than um, than uh, some of these big operations. I'm sure you're very used to. Um, 
Here we go, um, a beer in Mangareva after so much hot uh, and uh, so much hot days, uh, but the mission was accomplished. We operated from the two and here's the tally. As you can see from um, the first, um, uh, from Morane, we made about 10% of contacts in SSB and 90% in CW, but conditions dropped significantly uh, in, um, the propagation conditions dropped significantly when it got to Maria Est, and so the SSB dropped to 5%, um, you know, just half of the total amount of contacts. And uh, you see that uh, 40 meters, not unexpectedly, uh, was very, very uh, good for us, uh, was the savior there, um, as well as 30 meters, but not not from uh, not not that much from uh, from uh, from the second uh, destination. Uh, we work very very hard to balance um, to giving a chance to the continents. As you would know, uh, people complain all the time. It doesn't matter what you do. There will always be someone complaining. You haven't been there when you should have been there. You you know whatever. Um, but the percentages are such that uh, we think that at least among the main um, centers of amateur radio population, uh, Asia, Europe, North America, we, we, we gave uh, everything we could. And um, well, Oceania is mostly Australia and New Zealand, uh, just a couple of other stations here and there. Uh, but it gives you a little bit of an idea. And uh, again, uh, United States, uh, definitely top of the list uh, from both, but, um, and, and Japan second, and then of course, a number of Europeans, um, just to give you an idea of, um, so this was the QSL cards. Now you know the story, this is from one, this is the other. And obviously uh, we do benefit of a number of uh, very generous donors, uh, group donors, and uh, a, a lot of individual donors uh, without uh, whom we, we wouldn't have been able to cover um, a part of, of, uh, of this, uh, of, of our costs. Uh, usually, I, uh, you know, I, I, I try to um, disseminate as much as I can the information, both in order to, um, to um, you know, make more fans of IOTA, but also to document uh, the problems that we had, what we encountered, and um, hopefully somebody else will go some years from now, who knows when, uh, but they may find um, some useful information in, uh, in, in some of these. Um, then uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the month of March, just about three months later, um, I decided that um, just because I had a relationship with a teacher at a school in uh, on Little Diomede, that it might be nice to reactivate this this um, this um, island. Um, Little Diomede is part of North America 150, which is in demand by 100 minus this. It means about 89 percent, almost 90 percent of all the IOTA fans. And um, the problem with um, um, well, you know. The Little Diomede, which is right in the Bering Strait, um, I kind of knew about it, but it's different to actually see it with your own eyes. It's a, um, it's a there are continuous um, winds and currents and wind currents and uh, storms in the Bering Strait. So it's a, it's a relatively daring, um, um, daring weather. Um, the other issue which I knew from the very beginning is that the only settlement um, is supposed to be right on the western side and unfortunately the entire island raises like a big wall of rock um, towards North America. So North American stations would be hugely disadvantaged um, and what I thought in my mind was that um, maybe uh, I can find a way in, in, um, in winter to go on a snowmobile or with a, with a, with a sled um, all around, this, just around the coast and somehow attempt to operate from temporarily for even 24 hours, 30 hours from a point um, that, that would face you know, where the, the wall wouldn't obstruct the propagation. 
Um, I spoke about this with my contact and we thought it was going to be done. Unfortunately, the weather didn't help us and we couldn't do it. Um, arriving in Nome, just for you who are not necessarily super familiar, this is Nome. Um, so from Nome, uh, we have to fly with a helicopter. So I got uh, Ramon, um, Alpha Lima 7X ray. Um, to, he was very, very gracious and hosted me at his QTH um, for overnight. Uh, and he is with Ramon trying to discuss with the helicopter pilots and uh, see how I'm gonna put the double of weight that I was allowed uh, onto this helicopter. Um, and um, it was not a matter of being charged. Of course, they'll charge you, but um, there was, um, you know, there, there was a number of doctors and a number of um, dentists who were visiting the island unexpectedly for me. Uh, it was not part of the schedule. And um, all of a sudden, uh, you know, it, it had to be, uh, it was a very, very difficult negotiation. And I had to let a few things off the, 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 the helicopter. But in the end, they allowed me with everything that was important uh, radio wise. And, um, you know, so um, this is um, the beautiful, majestic uh, little Diomede uh, seen from, uh, as coming from uh, the east as we go west. So this is the wall that would obstruct propagation uh, to North America, um, or, or, uh, and you will see now where the location is. On the opposite side, uh, on the west side, uh, at, the, at, the, at the foot of this huge impressive hills, um, and um, um, this is the big Diomede, where um, about seven year, or eight years earlier, seven years earlier, a big uh, team from Russia operated. Um, it's a different. Uh, it's a different IOTA group, and they have been dropped by a, a large military uh, helicopter. There's a uh, military encampment on the other side of this, on the western side of the island, and they couldn't pick them up for a week um, past the due time. Uh, it was lucky for a lot of uh, hams who managed to, <laughs> a lot of island chasers who managed to to make a lot of contacts with them. Um, that's the little uh, station I had. Um, it's an ICOM 706 with um, an aircraft uh, amplifier, a small aircraft amplifier. Uh, it was windy all the time. Uh, and um, you see the amount of snow. It was one of the largest years of overall snowfall that uh, the, the locals, uh, the locals uh, ever witnessed. Um, but, uh, you know, we came to do what we could do. And uh, uh, you see the entrance to the school through probably about three meters of, um, of, uh, of snow. Uh, was that lots of, uh, you know, 30, um, was that um, uh, 10 feet of snow, probably 11, 12 feet of snow. Um, again, because of the wind, it was a struggle to um, put, uh, you know, to, you know, to, to change the bands. I had to do a number of uh, switches on the, um, um, you know, on, on the wires. And uh, every time you take the antenna down and you put it back, you have to fight with the wind. Um, and uh, that was not necessarily the, 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 the most difficult part. The most difficult part is that I didn't realize that the wind will throw millions of tiny little needle uh, feeling like um, particles of ice into, uh, into my face and, you know, um, and luckily, you know, the locals knew that and I got some, um, some ski goggles from, uh, from them that I could use or otherwise it would have been much more difficult. And you see now we're in full storm um, with more snow coming. And so weather was not really very, very cooperative. But uh, one day we decided, myself and the, um, uh, and, and the, uh, the school teacher who uh, invited me there, Rob, uh, to try to go around the village and try to climb um, this hill, attempt to climb the hill in hope that if we get out there, maybe it will be windy, maybe the antenna wouldn't stand any chance of being raised. But he thought of making an igloo 
um, and protect ourselves for maybe even just a few hours, just to give North America more of a chance. I've been able to work more than, I don't know, maybe 50, 55 contacts uh, with North American stations from, uh, from, uh, from the village. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't work out. Here, you know, I'm smiling. Um, is Rob and I uh, trying to head out, um, full of enthusiasm. Unfortunately, we didn't have the proper gear. We need the kind of, not just cleats, we had cleats, uh, but we didn't have the spikes that would allow you to hit in the ice and climb, hit and climb, hit and climb. Um, I didn't imagine it that way. Uh, he hasn't really, uh, he was a, he's a very um, athletic guy, but he hasn't tried the ascent in winter. And uh, he just, uh, we just couldn't do it. Um, the person who helped me um, from time to time to dig out the antenna and fix some of the rope, some of the wires was Anthony. Uh, and he is, is here and um, my thanks to both Rob and Anthony for, uh, well, actually um, at nighttime, um, it was getting a little bit darkish outside in, in March. It's, it's still kind of dark, quite a few hours of darkness. And uh, the locals were very jittery about polar bears coming, you know, just at random. Uh, I haven't seen one, but um, every night uh, before Rob would go to bed, uh, I would change the antenna uh, actually twice uh, per night uh, on different bands. Uh, once um, right after dinner time when he would come with a gun <laughs> and then um, just before he would go to bed. Um, and he was kind enough to push it as far as he could into the night so that I can operate first on 30 and then on 40 meters. I wouldn't go alone outside just because, um, you know, it was a school environment. And even if the kids were not there, he had a special permit that uh, uh, allow him the, the permits for guns in Alaska. But um, to have them on, 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 on school premises, he had to have a special permit. And I didn't want to, you know, abuse the system. We didn't want to take any risks. Who knows? There are no kids, but you no know, kids there, but the rule is the rule. So, um, we decided that I'm not going to take any chances. Um, and this is an image I took of one of the locals doing, you know, hunting for uh, seal hunt, doing uh, seal hunting. And as it snowed, fortunately, the figure is a little bit fluid, it, you know, but as it snowed, it, it crossed my mind that it's so similar to DXing because it does require some skill, but a lot, a lot of patience. So a couple more images. Um, this is after, after, the, after the snowstorm, you see how the locals build um, steps into the ice. This is hardly any snow here. I mean, it, it looks like mounds of snow, but it's actually ice because uh, under that wind uh, of a daily occurrence, of a constant occurrence, <laughs> um, it, it transform, ver transforms very quickly. It's not a puffy, it, it's, just, uh, it, it's just ice buildup. Uh, and it's just hard as cement. Uh, but they always keep one boat uh, clear, just in case they want to go. They, there's some animal or some, uh, uh, you know, something they want to hunt. Uh, they, they, they'll keep a boat uh, at all time clear. And the tally is not uh, that great. You can see that, um, you know, the, the, the North American hams are not in the top 10 DXCCs, which is very unfortunate, but it, you know, that's what it was. Uh, I still made a number of um, contacts and uh, the, the rate, the station to QSO ratio is, is pretty good. That means not a lot of people uh, operated me on different bands. I mean, keep contact me on different bands. And, you know, the, the, the ratio between Asia and Europe is very distant, but uh, well, of course, when North America goes to 2%, uh, that's not necessarily a very positive outcome. It's not what I had in mind. It's not what I wished, but um, well, lots of guys work North America 150. And uh, my big regret about this particular operation is that I was not prepared uh, to operate FT8. Uh, I don't know what my mind was. I, uh, I should have had that. I do operate FT8 uh, myself, particularly on six meters, but on other bands if conditions occur. And I should have tried FT8. I will never know if that FT8 would have um, worked 
uh, would have allowed me to log or the loud North American stations to log me a lot more than they did. Uh, that's my big regret about this particular one. Again, the QSL card, you know the story, my thanks to all the beautiful um, group and individual uh, sponsors whom I cannot be more grateful and a couple of, um, you know, uh, articles in uh, the German magazine and QSD that uh, we published. And last, uh, I think we have another few minutes. Um, uh, last operation was in September of last year and that was from Tillamook Rock, Oregon. Um, it's a relatively, it's a place of legend um, because so many things um, are associated with this, uh, with, with the lighthouse that is placed on this, on this uh, outcrop. Um, <clears throat> and the, 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 uh, the island is not that, the rock is not that far into the ocean. It's, it's probably about, I would say, a couple of miles, if that far. Um, <clears throat> But, uh, you know, um, the, the lighthouse was built there in, uh, if I remember correctly, 1980 was operational, uh, sorry, 1880 was operational, 8081, it operated until 1959, it was by far the most expensive lighthouse to operate, to men and operate um, in the United States during its time. And there's so more modern techniques now to, uh, to, to replace the lighthouse. And it was later transformed and per purchased and transformed into became um, uh, uh, available and was purchased and transformed into a columbarium, um, which was not a very successful enterprise, but um, the respective uh, organization um, very difficultly allowed uh, one uh, activator, one iota activator to operate from the first time from this rock 21 years earlier. And he didn't make a lot of contacts. Uh, he was there for just a few hours. He was dropped off and operated as much as he could. Um, but uh, we obviously wanted something a lot bigger. Now, not bigger compared to any of the uh, most of you DXCC chasers would have in mind, but a lot bigger than, than that. So we wanted to make a few thousand, thousands of contacts, obviously all the continents. Um, this was in demand by 91% of the IOTA chasers. And so uh, that in itself would be thousands and thousands of guys. I said there are about 4,000 cha IOTA chase, uh, uh, IOTA members. So sorry, 91% of the IOTA members who knows how many others would be out there maybe the figures we believe that there are approximately 10 to 12,000 cases who infrequently would uh, would look for uh, would try to make contact so it was a larger team made by Yuri who actually uh, N3QQ who actually obtained um, this uh, precious uh, developed this precious relationship with um, eternity with the owner of eternity at sea um, this um, um, this columbarium business, and then uh, a couple of very good friends of ours, uh, Sandro and Adrian, um, and um, he, you know, obviously uh, the, the cost of all this operation was just under twenty thousand um, dollars. It took about it took eleven rides back and forth to uh, to get to the islands and back. Uh, for the helicopter we used, and uh, for the for for the privilege of being uh, given the permit, the permission to operate by the owners, we uh, we um, uh, allow them to take advantage of these uh, helicopter rights, and uh, we support them for <coughs> uh, whatever cleaning operations and other kind of things they wanted to do. Unfortunately for them. Um, the volunteers they uh, they relied upon uh, were not happy with the um, with the uh, very terrible noise, uh, very terrible smell of all the um, um, products of animal waste, um, and they bailed out. But uh, we remained there, and you see the whole team before uh, we uh, in embarked on this uh, on this mission. This is Yuri. Uh, one of uh, the two pilots um, and uh, some of the volunteers involved in this process. Um, we're trying to get to the island. This is how it looks like um, from close. Uh, the memorable uh, photos. Uh, this is uh, 
Yuri, Sandro, and Adrian. And uh, we are finally right on the platform um, in front of the, um, of the lighthouse. Um, helicopters come and drop um, both radio equipment, uh, all sorts of others, uh, you know, camping equipment and uh, supplies for these, uh, cleaning supplies for, for these guys who are supposed to do some work. And you can see us setting up a camp on the little platform. Uh, now this is the camp is done. Uh, it's a little bit, uh, at some point, obviously the wind started to pick up. And this is a drone photo um, of the um, of uh, of the uh, of, of the island, just to give you of the rock, just to give you an idea um, how how the whole thing was. Um, so initially, we had uh, a multi-band uh, vertical installed uh, here, but uh, this was for the first night. Uh, the second night, we decided that we're going to spend time to install. Well, a couple of us. Uh, operated and the other two started to set up uh, a beam. Um, so that vertical was moved uh, in the back um, in a very awkward position. So just very approximate way of doing and it couldn't operate. Um, so we, we, we only used it later for 30 meters, uh, this band. Um, this is Sandro who worked very hard with uh, Yuri to, to, to set up uh, from, from parts, from components. Um, the, the beam, it like, took them hours and hours, but uh, anyway, we did it the best we could, not very far from, from, from the platform, but we quite above the ocean. Uh, it's a two element um, uh, or urban beam from uh, Step IR, they gracefully uh, allowed us to use it. And uh, <clears throat> we had a, um, um, a, step I, a big Step IR, uh, which was installed and we used for uh, 18 meters, 80 meters. So, um, uh, sorry, uh, 40, sorry, what I'm talking about, 40 meters, 40 meters, 40 and 17, uh, 30 meters was the other one, and the beam was only for 20 meters. Um, very shortly after we started the operation, um, the second day, uh, the, 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 after we, we, we finished the beam, uh, we had, it, so the, the wind started to pick up. And it picked up on it so much until eventually the, the rain and the wind destroyed the tents. Uh, we couldn't install them very well. Um, there was hardly any place to, to, um, to put them in. And um, we ran inside. So the last uh, about 36 hours of operation was from within the uh, lighthouse. Um, which was not a very clean environment, but uh, it was what it was. And uh, we surrounded constantly by the noises of the um, um, elephant seals and uh, or sea lions. And um, at night we had to stay on guard because the guys would just come up the stairs and uh, we, we, we tried to make sure they don't get entangled into antennas, both for their good and for ours. So uh, we were keeping on guard, and, and these are some uh, black cormorants. So we were keeping on guard constantly uh, throughout the day, throughout the night, make sure that every 30 minutes, every 40 minutes, someone would go and we'll check on them and make sure that we scare them off. Um, so uh, a few days, three days of operation, then we go in QRT. Uh, this is the team. Everything is assembled to go back. And uh, we managed about 33 contacts with 2,200 stations um, in 64 DXCC. Um, this time we did operate about 90% of the contacts were in FT8. Um, but again, the, the conditions were generally good, uh, I think. Or most parts of the more, most uh, parts of the world, so about 84 percent of of the contacts were in CW, and uh, we used intensively, intensively, obviously, uh, both 20 and 30 and 40 meters. You see, approximately a third of operations. Um, Japan and the United States, with a lot of stations, a lot of contacts, but uh, quite a few others as well. You know. Um, again, the QSL card, you're familiar with it now, with the story, and these are um, a part of uh, the sponsors. Um, German DX Foundation, Clipperton, you see them all the time, so at least once I have to mention them. Uh, RSGB, uh, Island Radio Expedition Foundation, this is exclusively an organization exclusively supporting uh, IOTA operations. 
uh, CDXC from um, from United Kingdom and um, Russian Robinson Club, uh, DX News, and the Stepfire who gave us the um, um, the Urban Beam. Again, uh, like always, I'm trying to um, um, popularize a little bit what we're trying to do, the program, and the fact that we got lucky and uh, the editors decided to um, feature. Uh, this this uh, this image on their uh, on, on their uh, cover of uh, of the QSD uh, a couple months ago was uh, like one of uh, um, our, our team members said uh, the uh, icing on the cake. So uh, yeah, we do appreciate very much. We didn't expect that, but uh, it does uh, bring uh, some smiles to those who contacted us and got the cards, and now they know the story. So. Um, this is uh, pretty much all uh, that I wanted to say. I think it's about for 50 minutes of uh, talking virtually nonstop. Uh, that's not giving you a lot of time for questions, but if there are any questions, uh, I'll be more than happy to um, entertain, to, to reply, to answer, to address. I had one comment and I, sent Caesar a picture, a screenshot of the operation. I think it was Maria that you were on. Um, okay. I was watching DX Heat, one of the uh, spotting, uh, online spotting things that I look, look at from time to time. And I had a full screen of TX0A or TX0M, I don't remember which one, but there were nobody else spotted. Nobody. Right. Um, from top to bottom. <laughs> I, I took a quick screenshot of it. It didn't last long, but it was pretty impressive what those guys were doing down there in the middle of that, uh, that, that island. I think that uh, I think that um, I do remember that. I, I think that um, uh, there are quite a, quite a lot of chasers who get the hang of this thing. Well, it's kind of a rare operation. I don't really know where the guys are, but it's, it's, it's something, you know, top of Himalaya, I don't know, some island uh, underwater. Yeah. So maybe in Antarctica, and it's kind of cool to work them. And um, sometimes they get the car, they kind of understand, they read about this or that. It doesn't have to be operations that I am associated with and many other guys who do operations all the time. Um, and, and somehow they said, mm, that's kind of an interesting thing, neat. The cards are cool. Let's try to get some more, and um, you know this is this is how uh, can possibly take off. Um, I think that what what we have done as a group, um, I, I I don't think I mentioned this, but I am the operations manager and the deputy general manager of Ayola uh, Limited, and uh, what we try to do by this um, by offering credits through QSO matching. Uh, we notice a lot of um, old timers, a lot. Well, well quite a few old timers um, who managed to confirm, as I said, six, seven hundred, five, six, seven hundred of um, um, operations that took place uh, many, many, many years ago. Um, it would have taken them, obviously, a huge amount of time. They might have never done it uh, to go through the QSL cards which they probably had um, to find out yeah. what. Now, with uh, the advent of, of this matching process, they already so much high up into the, into the game, so to say, that now they can go back and see, well, what am I missing? Um, so it, it does entice a, a number of people who, um, who uh, who would would have would have worked uh, such uh, such operations years and years and years you know over the years to to go back and uh, now find the time to fill in the blanks so to say um, but again um, uh, for for myself personally it, 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 it's a merger of a little bit of passion for adventure uh, amateur radio. And also this connection to others. Um, it, it's really, um, 
taken a very, very big impression on me uh, how sometimes going with one or two helpers in the Arctic, uh, and moving away from, from the boat, uh, I don't know, maybe half a mile, I look back and I think once I wrote, I don't think that some of these astronauts um, look, looking down to the earth, uh, they had a different impression of how, um, you know, a different impression of, of their umbilical cord to the world uh, is the same thing. I, we, we seem so powerless, so, so tiny and small compared to this adverse nature. But uh, teaming together, playing along, uh, helping each other, putting together, organi you know, organizing a trip like that, it's all, you know, it's all that the, what it takes to, in the end, reach, be successful, make some people happy and to live the dream, I guess. Uh, dream big and they have to fail, I guess, you know. <laughs> so, um, you know, but um, uh, yeah, I, I think that uh, I, I would encourage. Uh, now, what's our, uh, the, the goal of IOTA chasers and uh, activators is obviously to grow the, 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 the membership. Why? Because the more DXers you have, the more, well, statistically speaking, more funding you will have available. If more clubs, not just in North America, although the United States is by far the number one source of um, support and donations for, for these trips, but in Europe as well, or in Japan, uh, if they become interested um, and have their own internal rosters for, like they have for the XCC, also for IOTA, maybe uh, they will afford at least from some of the operations, not necessarily, uh, you know, all of them, um, to contribute to some of these trips. And, and hopefully with, with that participation, we can drop um, this inter, the, you know, this uh, visitation lapse time from 20, 30 years down in, in some places down to maybe 15 or 12 or 10. Um, so that j just imagine that somebody goes to the extent of, of traveling to that place for two, three days or four days or five days because that's, that's all they can afford. And, and um, the propagation conditions are such that, um, well, not all parts of the world have a chance. One is kind of blank. Well, it may take another 20, 25 years <laughs> until uh, an operation like that will, will come along again. So yes, we'd like to, um, to reduce that as much as possible. And I think that the only way to do that is by bringing more, uh, more members, of, more, more, more chasers, more, more people who are interested in, in these operations who find, uh, you know, uh, worth spending an extra, I don't know, $5, $10 if they can afford. Uh, you know, small amounts made by, uh, small donations made by each um, individual uh, amplify considerably at the end of the day when, you know, maybe, um, you know, hundreds of maybe two, three hundred, four hundred people um, get together and contribute. So, yes, this is kind of uh, the goal. Now, IOTA Limited, um, now that we are going through this process, and we do see um, uh, 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 that, that our uh, funding is reliable. So we can continue developing the software and uh, the IT, everything that we need to develop for the system to function properly. Uh, we are um, considering, we have always considered that, but now we are going to um, make substantial donations ourselves from because we are a non-profit organization so all the money has to go out um, to organizations supporting iota operations so yes for us it is a little bit different uh, we you know they, they might some of some of our some of these organizations obviously will continue to support uh, any kind of dxcc major operation and that's great but um we are trying to uh, dedicate this support to operations uh, that are specifically uh, for 
rare IOTA or difficult remote IOTA um, uh, groups to to be um, to be uh, brought on the air somewhat more often. That's kind of the idea. Don't uh, there are probably um, 500, if not 600 groups, which are on the air every year, if not every other year, uh, maybe every two three years, let's say. Um, but uh, there would be probably two, three hundred groups that would be no more often than once every five to ten years, and probably another two hundred groups, which maybe less, I don't know, I haven't really counted, which would be on the air every 15 to 20 or, or, or less years. So um, I, I know you're going to say, uh, many people would say, okay, well, we, we already have uh, so great difficulty to support this large DXCC operations. Well, um, IOTA, for whatever is worth it, um, we do not have a, uh, a, a, a so-called challenge uh, program similar to the DXCC challenge, where you'd like to work everything on every band and, you know. So, <clears throat> um, we are so, because by doing that, uh, we will reduce considerably uh, the number of um, chasers who will be able to enjoy this, uh, this type of operations. There will be some who will obviously uh, demand uh, the operators to go on all bands, uh, as many as they can, and so on and so forth. So the way we're trying to do it, we're trying to uh, popularize this idea. Well, operate on one, operate on two or three bands, the ones that are uh, really uh, <clears throat> on which propagation is, uh, is, is um, open to major parts of the world and get as many uh, hams as you can, make them happy and move on. So it is a little bit different than, uh, it is obviously a little bit different. And I'm, I'm not trying to uh, say uh, any comparison. I, you know, DXCC is so much larger in, in, uh, uh, in everything. Um, and, and we do understand that and respect that. Uh, vast majority of the IOTA members are, have long standing in the DXCC as, as you know, so, sorry. Cesar, I understand now hey, Wayne, how I could not work you from Little to I meeting. <laughs> yes, I do apologize. It was, um, it, was, uh, it was very difficult. I remember that N4, um, uh, N4MM, I think, uh, you know, uh, he just couldn't believe it because he was pushing everything and he has some phenomenal equipment, you too probably. Um, Yes, it's, uh, I, I, I know there are a lot of people who do not like FT8 for one reason or another, it's something losing, it's computers, whatever. And I'm not interested in um, taking sites, uh, but that would have been an experiment worth doing. And I do regret profusely that now, you're gonna say, well, what it why, why didn't I, wasn't I, what, I had everything there, why wasn't I able to do it? Because I didn't have some connectors I needed to have. Everything was else was there. I had the, the you know I had everything on my laptop, but I did not do not I was not prepared for it, and it was very dumb. Very very sorry about this. Uh, but <laughs> the good news about Little Diomede is that um, I don't know if, if because of my failure or because of uh, a little bit of a popularization that I made to Little Diomede in uh, uh, QSD and uh, you know. But I do know of a couple of North American, uh, of US hams uh, are actually planning. Well, unfortunately we are right now in a period of time with a lot of restrictions and who knows when uh, we could go really back, but uh, uh, they do actually plan to uh, ascend that <laughs> rock in the summer. See, the, the, the problem with the summer there is that there's no school. And so you have to stay, the, the school is closed. There's, you cannot get into the school. Um, the school is the only place that has potable water that is treated and recommended. So, um, you know, you have to bring also water, you have to bring this and that. It's uh, the level of, um, and, and, and the, there's nobody, I mean, I, I assume there might be some local who can help Unfortunately, none of the previous operations, uh, which I think were three, uh, uh, mine excluded, 
uh, were able to convince the locals to help them travel and operate on top of the mountain. So I'm not trying to say that it's impossible. I'm sure that if you, if you throw some resources there, they'll help. But um, the school was a facilitator. This, this teacher was a facilitator. And uh, Rob uh, is his name. And he allowed me to um, take advantage of uh, a nice and comfortable uh, sleeping area. And, you know, yeah. So, yeah. It, it, there was a little bit of a different, um, yeah. So I have traveled many times in the Arctic uh, with the natives. And um, sometimes it looks like we're talking the same thing, but we do not understand each other. And they think I want something and I want something different. And by the time I explain them, they get very nervous. And, uh, you know, so uh, it's, it's, um, it's not uh, necessarily as, as straightforward, as easy as, uh, as it, it might, see, might, might seem. But I am deeply regretful that I, I don't know, I must have had a terrible time. Uh, you know, I should have at least, just like an experiment, like, you know, do the experiment. Does the FTA work? Uh, would have been able to, you know. Now, for whatever was worth it, I did copy now and then some signals, but they wouldn't copy me. Um, and I operated with eh, about 400 watts. So, you know, um, that would have made a difference probably in FT8. But again, I, you know, uh, yeah. So I'm very, very sorry about this. But the good news is that I don't think it's going to take 10 years until someone else will venture again to uh, to them. It's a it's a very 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 interesting place. Cool. I had a question. Um, first of all, I'm sorry. We're I want to try and pronounce your name, <clears throat> uh, and I have I apologize beforehand if I if I get this wrong. Is it Cesar Trefu? Sure. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, 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 you know, I, my, my first name is, well, I, I was born in Romania and the, the first name is uh, a Romanian translation, a, a Romanian way of spelling the great emperor Julius Caesar's name. It comes from there. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, my mom would pronounce it Cesar. Oh, but, okay. But here, pretty much everyone around pronounces it Caesar, and then it's Caesar's B. So you know, yeah. uh, it's it's not that important. Uh, you know, of course it is for to, to me, but um, I think more important is uh, V3LYC because uh, when I came to Canada, uh, you know, I and I, I I tried to get a license with a, a two-letter suffix. Um, I was immediately, you know, no, 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 no. You have to have, I don't know, years and years of seniority is not going to happen. And by the way, there's a V3 YC in town. Um, and so, well, what about VA3 YC, which I kind of hated because for one reason or other, you know, I don't like the way VA is in CW, but just me. Um, they said, oh, no, we're not going to have VE and VA in the same city. It's just nonsense. We're not going to happen. So then uh, I kind of uh, worked my way and at some point, uh, some uh, guys in the Canadian, uh, uh, you know, in uh, Radio Islanders of Canada said, well, you know, uh, why don't you get a two letter suffix? Well, they actually said, well, listen, it took me a great long number of years to work my way up with this three. I'm not gonna start from scratch just because it's a two letter suffix. So just forget about it. I'm fine with V3 LYC and I'll stay with V3 LYC. I don't wanna change it, it's fine the way it is. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's, uh, I, I, uh, I, um, I, got, I got used to it obviously. And um, as, as you know, uh, Wayne and Dick and some of the other guys, Tony, um, you know, I try to use uh, different call signs usually where I'm operating from just because, um, you know, it's, it's not, but, but most of the time, I mean, many, many occasions it's, it's a team operation. So you can use VA3 OIC. I don't like that. Um, and, and second, it's so much catch here. You know, if uh, Tango X3 Zero Alpha, <laughs> mm -hmm. 
<laughs> uh, the other question I had uh, with regard to the antennas, uh, do you always take at least two? Uh, why did you choose the vertical? And uh, so you did not use a tuner. Uh, could you just explain a little bit about the why you like the vertical and right? Uh, that's the a counter, great, you use the counterpoise or do you? That's a great, that's a great question. That's a great question, um, and it's a great question because uh, you know I I had so much. Um, um, there, there's so much in you know there's so much uh, input that got into uh, this decision making process, right? So no, um, I use the uh, multi band vertical because it uh, it weights about half a pound, and the mast that I have for one antenna weights about um, one and a half pound. And so I always take two antennas. And if we go as a team and using that, I always take three. Because, you know, another half a pound, okay, bubble wrap and think, put another pound. And I, it's not going to matter, you know. Um, and now, what's the reason why I'm using this? Well, the main reason I'm using this antenna was originally weight because I travel by helicopters or by tiny little planes where um, the pilots would look at your socks and would say, why do you need three? We only go there for three days. You already have one on you. That's it. I'm not taking anything else. And then you take the socks out and on and on and on and on. And by the end of it, uh, you know, they, 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 they open the stuff and they ask you, why do you need two of these? Why do you need this? Why do you need that? Why do you need tools? Why? So um, <clears throat> this type of antenna is so easy to fix if it breaks, if anything happens with it. Eventually, it takes literally a few minutes, even under stormy conditions. It wouldn't take much. Um, to, to, to fix it and you're back in business. Um, the other issue, so weight, it's number one. Number two is that this particular antennas, which are homemade, um, indeed, they do not require antenna tuners. Now, it's not a big deal. An antenna tuner, it's only, I don't know, what I have here is probably about three pounds. But you have to put it in a case. You can't just take it like that. And then... It's another three pounds plus another two pounds plus another three pounds. And then, you know, it just easily gets out of control. So um, it was the equipment I have. Um, each station is in one Pelican case, one small Pelican case. Uh, it looks kind of like the station is actually in. It kind of looks like this. Okay. So there the are two of them. Absolutely identical. And they have, you know, if, if somebody, if, if this COVID-19 restrictions would stop in two hours and I could buy a ticket in the next two hours, then tomorrow morning I could be on the plane just by taking them because they have everything inside that, that I need. Uh, well, plus the laptop that, you know, it's my laptop, the one that I'm using now or the one that I, it's not the one I use for the station. This is a different, it's a little bit of a heavier laptop. And that's pretty much it. So, <clears throat> um, sure, that doesn't satisfy the um, the uh, the XCC requirements. <laughs> or, you know, um, I actually do have an amplifier which I used a few times um, if the conditions allow to transport it. And um, if you go as a team, uh, there's always more room to and and you know some of the some of the um, team members would insist on that so then you have to 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 do it and so on and so forth but um the the, the general idea is that sometimes you have to um uh, to design the operation based on a few elements which are very important um uh, one is is the 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 actual um uh, contingencies that you need to have. Uh, what are the minimum requirements and what contingencies you need to have? Should I better uh, take another rig 
or should I take another, uh, should I take an antenna tuner? Uh, because uh, I may not be able to take them both. And if I can take an amplifier, then, you know, what kind of amplifier, how heavy it is, and so on and so forth. So um, I try to, to, to um, um, make things as light as possible and, yeah, compensate a little bit with a little bit of an operation skill. But I, I agree with you. You can do too much. Uh, it's... it's um, um, however, and as far as the antenna specifically, specifically the antenna is concerned, Adrian, uh, whom I'm sure you're familiar for different operations that he's carried out himself, not necessarily IOTA, but DXCCs, um, Oscar 8, Sierra Charlie Alpha, um, he saw how well the, um, the, um, the, 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 the verticals operated. And given the fact that the water was right there, we had internal lagoons, which is actually salt, and we had the, the, the sea all around us. Um, the conditions were such that, you know, to have better conditions on 30 and 40 than these dipoles, yeah, that would have required quite a bit of preoccupation. And, uh, uh, you, you know, you're not going to get away with putting a beam, uh, you know, 20 feet above, above the above the, uh, uh, you know, uh, in the air, uh, that that's not going to offer really anything far superior. So, um, yeah, we, we tailor things to the scope that we had, and the scope was to be light, to reduce the, um, the overall uh, con um, complexity of the, of the, uh, of the, um, of the project uh, and allow instead for contingencies so that if some equipment fails, um, we had a, a, the famous operation which took place from a very rare island in southern Alaska, very rare island in southern Alaska, quite a few years back. I don't remember exactly, but I would say about 15 years ago. Um, there was a gentleman, um, very, very good and uh, known uh, activator and operator, uh, Lenny, W5BOS. He made one contact, the rig, give in, gave in, and that was the end of his operation. Uh, and then it had to, about a couple of years later, he had to go back and redo it again because it was such an embarrassment. Um, he had no second equipment. He had no contingency. Okay. And then we had another case um, from uh, another Maria in, um, in a different other, in, in other part of uh, the, another Maria at all, not from Oceania 155, from a different, uh, where a group of Italians, um, Italy, Tango 9, Yankee Romeo Echo, Italy 1, uh, Sierra November Whiskey, a couple of guys went. And unfortunately, there, there was an entrance in the lagoon, a very tight entrance into the lagoon, and the waters were not that deep, but the guys were, they had the, well, one, of, one of the operators that had this, had this um, I guess, almost like a paranoia, he was afraid of sharks. It's just, you know, just, you, you, can't, uh, you, you can't control that. And he wanted to stay in the dinghy. <laughs> and he was a heavy guy. Uh, bottom line, dinghy flipped. Uh, the equipment was all in cases, but unlike the equipment I have, which is always in, um, in uh, dry bags and then in cases, or the cases are in dry bags. Um, no, you know, they were not, they were waterproof. If it rains, it's okay, but not uh, submersible. They're, they're not, you know, and they were done. Uh, they, they couldn't do it. Uh, they had to go back uh, a year later to uh, attempt operating. And uh, I think that that trip uh, cost probably, I don't know, I don't remember exactly, but they, probably around $30,000 for the whole team. They, they, um, they, they, um, they went, I think, five or six days from uh, Tahiti by catamaran one way, and then they had to go back all for all this nonsense that happened there. So uh, 
I, I don't remember what antennas they had. They might have had great antennas, but uh, there, there was nothing they could do. All the equipment was compromised. <laughs> so uh, this, I mean, we learn from them. I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to mention this as uh, things happen, right? Um, but what you're trying to do is to reduce the, um, the possibility of mishaps by um, trying to build contingencies and, and trying to, Again, sure, if we have the helicopters putting up and dropping up, we, you, we had on, uh, on Tillamook, we had uh, three amplifiers, we had no problem, we worked with 1500 watts or 1000 watts, we had three generators, like, you know, it was uh, everything you wanted. There wasn't room for the antenna, <laughs> so we, we put that, um, that um, a two element beam and <laughs> you had to uh, swing it only between uh, Japan and uh, Europe because that, that there was no room to swing it around in that particular place. Not that we need it, I'm just saying. Uh, but um, yeah, so we, we yeah. were trying to use uh, something tailored to the conditions. And um, if, if you have to uh, drive in winter, I mean, to be driven in winter uh, to some places uh, up in the Arctic and there's only one person, probably not going to be able to install a Yagi. Uh, it's just not going to happen. Um, and just to give you an idea, um, just as a curiosity, it used to cost um, about 25 years ago, I know that from a ham, uh, Martin G3ZAY, who operated from a number of uh, Antarctic, uh, from uh, Arctic, Arctic, uh, Canadian Arctic I uh, islands and IOTA groups, uh, a trip at uh, 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 the airfare from um, uh, Ottawa to Resolute Bay, which is the big um, communications center in the north, where, from where tiny planes can be hired in advance, obviously, private, not private, um, for private projects to go whatever your interest is to do. But commercial flight from Ottawa to um, um, Iqaluit, which is the capital of Nunavut, and from there to Resolute Bay, was approximately uh, $1,200 Canadian, in, which is less than $1,000 US nowadays. But that was in, um, uh, uh, sorry, 25 years ago. Today, the cost of the ticket is $7,400 Canadian, um, which I'm not gonna even say, it's probably 5,800, say 6,000. So we're talking about five times, five, six times, five, six times higher prices. Why? The number of reasons, I'm not gonna go into them because they're partly political. Um, <clears throat> Nunavut is, is now a province and all the airlines going there are, are uh, operated by you know, in a certain way by, by, the, uh, by the province. Um, and um, I guess they don't want tourists. <laughs> it's just as simple as that. They're clearly not hams. In many of these places uh, that I visited in the Canadian North, um, they haven't seen a tourist uh, or, a, you know, or, or someone from the South in three, four years, maybe, maybe longer. So, um, you, you have to be uh, very um, considerate, in my opinion. Then also, you know, uh, uh, another 10 pounds or 5 pounds um, may lead to an increase in costs, an increase in complexity, an increase in, um, yeah, the complexity of, of this, uh, of, this op of, of an operation. And, um, I try to minimize it as much as I can, but if the conditions permit, oh, I, I'll go with amplifiers and they have no problem whatsoever. And we tried the, the beam, we tried, I'm sure we'll try it some other time if, uh, if conditions exist. But um, yeah, it was the principle of uh, going small in a tiny little hole, in a red hole <laughs> and operate and get out as far as you get in and get out. That was kind of the, the mission. Uh, yeah. Oh, outstanding. Sam, you got anything else? Uh, 
No, does anyone else uh, have any questions? Uh, Cesar, this is Don, WS4NC. Thank you for doing the program tonight, and thank you for doing what you do, because this is what a part of what really makes amateur radio so special in the contacting places like that. Thank you very much, Don. And we really uh, appreciate what you do. I, I have to confess, and uh, what you just said, but thank you very much. And um, this shouldn't go to me. This should go to, I would say, hundreds of activators who every year, now I understand this is a, real, it's a pretty darn different year, and I'm not sure when exactly we'll go back to some form of normality, but um, <clears throat> they are uh, bringing us numerous moments of, 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 uh, of satisfaction through, 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 I guess, their passion and, uh, and their willingness to go places. But I have to mention something. Now, you made uh, this comment um, f quite a few years back when I was really going bare bones, bare foot, bare everything uh, up in the Arctic. And the reason at the time was that just the cost was horrendous and nobody wanted to join me. Nobody really said, well, say, well, you know, if you go to some island in the Pacific, well, sure. I mean, yeah, it would cost, but I'm with, but I'm not going there in winter. You're kidding me? Nah, I'm not going. Um, so then I decided to go as minimal as I could. Uh, <clears throat> fair enough. I was uh, very moved at some point by a particular letter or a message, a particular email that I got after the operation when uh, somebody told me, uh, Caesar, for one reason or another, I don't know how to say, but you put the amateur back in radio amateur. Um, I, at the time, I, I didn't have as much travel. I didn't have as many operations. I was really moved though by that because what I was trying to do was indeed bare minimum. So, you know, but it doesn't necessarily, um, don't take this too seriously because um, what we do these days and what some people do these days through all this development and enhancements, uh, you know, F D eight and everything else, it's just pouring more and more um, um, water juice and, you know, excitement into the hobby. Um, it's, uh, I, I know that not everybody likes um, some of this stuff. Well, there are many people not liking CW for what, what, what it was worth it, which is my preferred way of, my mode of operation, you know? But um, to get a CW report and a call sign uh, in from some remote place like that, to me, it seemed possible. And I, well, this was a pre-FT8 era anyway. <laughs> Uh, so um, I kind of got hooked to that, and um, I, I, I really liked uh, the both ends of it. Uh, and, and IOTA, for one reason or another, um, uh, gives you credit um, for the groups you operate from. So I don't have to wait another 20, 25 years until some of these groups are back on the air. I actually do get credit myself, which is <laughs> somehow... Uh, but I'm pretty thankful to that. So anyway, um, so thank you very much, gentlemen, for having me. I don't know if uh, any of you somehow decided that um, you know now that the six meters six meter season is kind of dead, uh, you know, and we have to go back to HF. Um, with so little expeditions, uh, so so few expeditions coming up, uh, famous expeditions uh, to rare places and so on and so forth, they might give it a try to this Ayora thing. <laughs> but um, uh, if you do, by all means, uh, drop me a line. And if you need any, I don't know, help or any suggestions, any more resources, I'll be more than happy to share them right away with you guys. So thank you very much, Sam, for having me. And um, um, here. thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, we give you a standing ovation if we were meeting in person, but uh, we're <laughs> on Zoom, so uh, we'll just wave. We we enjoyed that, and we thank you so much for uh, 
uh, being with us tonight. Much. Thank you. I, I realize that not being in person, you don't get the same feel and that's mutual, but um, you know, I, I hope that um, uh, we'll see some of you guys on the air. Thank you so much. Uh, I notice you're not in my log book, log book, but I'm going to look for you uh, down the road. Okay, we enjoyed that very much. Uh, great presentation. Uh, I wanted to remind everybody that uh, Wednesday night we have our technical and talk uh, meeting everybody's welcome and then of course a week from tonight will be our board meeting uh, we'll still be meeting in, on zoom for our board meeting so uh with that does anybody have anything else tonight i'm good everybody's good, good. okay well uh and we're going to hang around tonight and talk. If you want to hang around, you're just welcome to hang around and talk tonight for a while. Uh, but other than that, uh, to close nice. the meeting. Thank you. Uh, do I hear a motion? Motion to adjourn. Okay. Here's a second. I second. Okay. Meeting's adjourned. And like I say, everybody can hang around and uh, talk.